Hi, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Book It with CA. A juicy love story can really brighten your day. I mean, who doesn't need a little happily ever after right now? So today we are chatting with four authors who will tug at your heartstrings with their diverse, fresh take on the romance novel. We've got some romantic comedy with Kate Stamen London, author of One to Watch, Mia Sosa, who's out with The Worst Best Man, and Talia Hibbert, whose recent book is Take a Hint, Danny Brown. Also, Leslie Penelope joins us to talk about her romance fantasy blend in Cry of Metal and Bone. So stick around, you might just find your own happily ever after. Talia, Leslie, Mia, Kate, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having Thanks us. For having us. <laughs> so I got to start that by saying that I really enjoyed all of your books and I feel like it's so great for me because now I get to talk to you about them. So I feel very fortunate. Uh, I'd love to start by asking each of you to give us just a few words about your stories, how they unfold. Uh, and please don't give anything away because as a reader, I hate when that happens. So Mia, why don't we start with you and The Worst Best Man. It's a very fun title. So The Worst Best Man is a rom-com and it is about Carolina Santos, who is an up and coming wedding planner in the DC area. Um, she also happens to be a jilted bride and she learns that she is a jilted bride from her fiance's younger brother. Um, she also discovers in that conversation that the younger brother and her fiance had a conversation the night before they were to get married and something in that conversation led the fiance to decide not to marry her. Mm -hmm. Fast forward three years and she is uh, going for an unconventional job interview. It is basically her dream job and she learns that she has to work with one uh, or both of the people she really can't stand, the fiance and the younger brother. And uh, she ends up working with the lesser of two evils, the younger brother. And uh, it's not a spoiler because it's a romance. They do live happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell you, your book is Take a Hint, Danny Brown, which is the latest in your books about the Brown sisters. So tell us what's going on with Danny. Uh, well, Danny is a harried PhD student who doesn't believe in love and she fakes a relationship with a friend from work, a security guard, who is a hopeless romantic. Um, it's kind of like a taking advantage of social media attention for the purposes of promoting his charity, mm -hmm. but the fake relationship gets a bit too real. Shenanigans ensue. <laughs> yes, yes, shenanigans. I love it. <laughs> Leslie, Cry of Metal and Bone, really a combination of fantasy and romance. Tell us about the storyline there. So it takes place in a world where these two countries that have been at war for a long time are trying to find their way towards peace, but there's a lot of like societal strife still. And so there's a terrorist attack that happens. Um, and so these two, the king and queen of one of the countries puts together a team to investigate and to try to prevent future terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. So on the team is a socialite named Lisbeth Neral, who has um, made some mistakes in the past and is trying to make retribution for those. And there's also a smuggler named Ty Summerhawk. And these are opposites attract. They have to work together for a common goal. Um, so it's an alternate 1920s world with a lot of magic. It's a little bit of diesel punk and fantasy. Yeah, some imagination you have, by the way. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Kate, let's talk about One to Watch. Um, sort of based on reality TV, but with a twist, a lot of twists, actually. Yeah, the most dramatic season ever. A One to Watch is the story of a plus-size blogger named B. Schumacher, who has her world turned totally upside down when she writes a blog post criticizing her favorite dating reality show, which is called Main Squeeze in the book, but which might remind you of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And she criticizes the show for its lack of diversity, racial diversity, queer inclusiveness, body diversity especially. Her post goes viral, and she gets asked to be the next star of the show. But there's just one problem, which is that she's getting over a massively broken heart and is totally off dating. So she says yes to doing the show, but under one condition, she absolutely refuses to fall in love. And it gets tricky from there. It does. So guys, I'd like to talk about 
romance as a genre, because I think that each of you, and you, you've sort of hinted at this a bit just in your descriptions, get at something that I find very interesting, which is this notion of kind of defying the expectations that some people might have of what a romance novel is. Um, Talia, I'd, I'd like to start with you because you describe your writing as steamy, diverse romance and say that people of marginalized identities need honest, positive representation. So tell me how you do that in your novels. Um, well, I've always loved to read romance and I started out with what was at the time mainstream romance, which was a very white, heterosexual, able-bodied lens. So when I eventually found out that there were people writing romance novels about people who looked and lived more like me, that was a huge revelation. And that was when I knew that that was kind of what I wanted to do as well. Um, so being able to read work like that is what has really informed a lot of my decisions. But I think when I'm writing books, I just like to include perspectives and identities that aren't always prioritized. And I like to uplift them and put them first. And romance is very uplifting. So it's a nice genre to do that in. And Mia, in The Worst Best Man, Lena, your main character, is a first generation Brazilian American woman, um, which you know comes with some expectations of herself and with her community. Um, and there's this conversation that she has at one point with you know, one of the male characters that you were talking about, where she says, a black woman isn't justifiably upset, she's angry. A Latinx person confronts someone, they're fiery or feisty. A woman gets emotional in the workplace, she's irrational. So I'd love to talk about the choice to include that kind of dialogue in the book. Well, one of the things that I always try to do in my romances is convince the reader that the two people who are ultimately going to get together um, make sense and that they're going to work beyond the end of the book. And it's an interracial romance. So I felt it was important to have that conversation. It doesn't have to be a huge conversation, but it's sort of an acknowledgement that Lena navigates the world in a different way. She navigates it differently than her partner. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, have the conversation about it, um, have Max, the hero, understand that and then kind of move on with the rest of the shenanigans. It's kind of, it's kind of that, not so much a footnote, but a bookmark that sort of says, here's who I am and I want you to acknowledge that. And I think that helps them sort of be stronger together. Kate, in One to Watch, you know, as you already explained, B is a plus-sized woman who's on this reality dating show. And she says at one point, and this is kind of a theme throughout the book, that she um, wants to prove that she can be the star of the show about love as much as any other person could be in such a show. But it, to me, it really gets to this issue that I think a lot of women grapple with, which is that somehow being skinny or looking a certain way, not another way, defines our worth or even maybe gets at how lovable we are. So mm. I wondered what you wanted the reader to take away from that. Um, that that way of thinking is total garbage and that it's something that, that, that benefits men and it takes away our women's power and our money and our time and our energy and our ability to experience our own lives on our own terms, right? And I think that it's something that fat women understand particularly well, but that all women understand when we look at the fact that the diet industry takes in $70 billion a year, even though research tells us that 97% of diets fail and that especially when the diet has to do with how much you weigh and not health characteristics like your blood pressure or your blood sugar or something like that, that diets that are related to actual health measures measurements do make a difference, right? Because we want to be healthy, but being thin and being healthy aren't the same thing. So what I wanted to do with One to Watch was write a rom-com that shows a woman experiencing her power and sort of, she's not this, you know, boss tough woman from the very beginning who already is able to sort of shun the societal constraints. She figures out how to do that during the course of the book in front of an audience of a few million people. So that was what I was really interested in was sort of going on that journey with her and inviting readers to experience that in their own lives. Because she's conflicted herself. It's not yes. as if she is, um, 100% confident in every single moment. Yeah, there's a line early in the book where she talks about the difference between what you know and what you feel. And that's definitely something that I experience a lot in my life that I can really know X, Y, and Z thing, but it's still like 
you know, if I don't get a writing assignment or if a date goes badly or whatever to say, oh God, if only I could lose 20 pounds, maybe that would have turned out differently, which is of course ridiculous, but yeah. it's such a pervasive message that we all live with in our media and in our culture um, that it's hard to shake sometimes. So uh, what I hope is that readers will be able to go on that journey to from knowing the thing to actually being able to feel it. Um, so Leslie, Cry of Metal and Bone, as we said already, it's really a combination of romance and fantasy. Uh, and you create this whole other world, uh, a very complex other world. Okay, but what struck me about that was that in this other world, you're making these very pointed comments about our actual world, um, specifically around issues like race and immigration and nationalism. And, you know, I, and I understand you do that in a lot of your work. And I just wonder um, that, about that approach of being in one world and talking about the other one. Yeah, I think that's what always drew me to fantasy and science fiction. Like speculative fiction in general is really great for making commentary for our world while taking it away from some of the baggage that we have. So if you can view these issues through another lens where it's not the, the factions that we are familiar with, but it's a similar idea. So there's a refugee crisis in my series, you know, that you said that there's racism, there's homophobia, there's um, nationalism. And I find that like taking it out of our world and, and creating these same kind of human struggles that are in a different world, um, it just allows you to look at them differently and, and create a little bit of empathy, I'm hoping, um, for those kind of struggles. Do you think the message may be better received or more thoroughly received coming in that format? I think so. I think that um, speculative fiction, whether it's fantasy or even horror, has always taken these things, made, made monsters um, as, as, a, as a metaphor, you know? And so we can look at what is monstrous in uh, something that's actually a creature and then be able to extrapolate that and, and hopefully have some empathy towards real people who are treated as monsters in our society. And that's, that's part of what I'm hoping to do while you're in this adventure story that has a romance in it. So you're not being preached to, but there's something that's underlying psychologically that I think hopefully allows people to relate to other people in a, in a meaningful way. You know, my takeaway from reading, you know, all of your books was that, you know, romance can be fun, it can be flirty, it can be steamy, but it can be feminist. Uh, do you think that that is the understanding of the romance novel today? I feel like because romance has historically been a genre dominated by marginalized genders, it does make sense for it maybe to be towards the forefront when it comes to feminist developments in society. And obviously society is always reflected in the things that we write and the things that we want to read. So I feel like there have long been kind of books with very feminist elements or just feminist books full stop in the romance genre. And I feel like that's definitely something that's happening more and more as it ages and becomes even more fabulous with time. <laughs> Do you guys see the genre changing? Uh, my bookshelves look really different. Um, I, uh, I have been a romance reader since I was probably about 14, 15 years old. And, um, you know, back then I didn't buy them all the time. I got them at the library. Um, but even over the course of the last 10 years or so, I have noticed how much uh, diversity and inclusivity is reflected in the romance novels that I have on my shelves. And actually, I think the interesting thing is that I am more apt to buy books today than I ever been because I know that I can pick up a book that is inclusive and diverse and that is going to tackle these issues that have been tackled but aren't um, or haven't been tackled to the extent that they're being tackled today. Um, so it's amazing. I feel like I'm filling my shelves with just these gorgeous stories that um, recognize people who traditionally haven't been recognized in romance. It just brings me so much joy to see that. I always love to hear about the process of writing. Um, so I wonder if any of you have any quirks or habits or I don't know, a favorite snack or a particular place, the kinds of things that you do, the rituals that help you write. I'd love to hear about those if anyone wants to volunteer. I just started um, a new thing. It's only been for two books, but I have decided that this is going to be my thing that I start uh, to do each time I um, work on a novel, which is I buy a hoodie 
it's really odd, but it's, um, Interesting. I, I love being cozy in my office. And I've heard about a lot of snacks, but I've never heard of hoodie. <laughs> is the hoodie thematically related to the book that you're working on, or is it just like a joyful yeah. accompaniment? <laughs> now that you say that, um, it's interesting because the hoodie that I'm wearing these days, um, my husband bought for me and it has a flag of Brazil on it. And this story has a Brazilian American heroine, um, the second story that I'm working on. And so I'm now thinking I'm gonna do it thematically. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Anybody else got one they wanna share? I don't think it's as cool as that. I, mine is pretty simple. I love the hoodie idea. Um, I try to keep it simple so that I can, I'm not locked into things so that I can kind of write wherever I am, but I always have tea. And I feel like if I'm not drinking tea, then I'm not ready to write. Like making the tea is part of just the process of saying, okay, now this is time to write. I have to sit here and tell whatever my goal of this writing session is done. I'm really inspired by travel, which has been a, a challenge of 2020. But so like there's, portions of one to watch that take place in France and Morocco, which are two of my favorite countries. And I traveled to both in the months before I started writing and being able to draw on those experiences was really important to me. Tell you, you got to give us one now. <laughs> I feel so boring. I don't do anything. Maybe I just anything. sit in this quiet, empty room and just, I just go for it. What is the hardest part of writing romance? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's um, uh, the vulnerability, you know, when I'm writing a really devastating breakup scene or a character who's feeling really insecure of like going to my own sort of tough feelings and insecurities and then knowing that I'm putting them on. I had a total moment of just like dire panic a couple months before One to Watch came out of like, I made a big mistake. I wrote about my deepest insecurities and now a lot of people are going to read about them. I didn't think this through. And so that for me is always, but it's like, if you don't do that, then, you know, the character isn't, if it's not for me grounded in real emotion that you've experienced, it's not going to be believable on the page. So you kind of just have to go there. For me, I think it's, I'm a plotter, so I, I plan everything in advance and trying to figure out exactly what makes these two perfect for each other. Because sometimes it comes, sometimes you're just inspired and you're like, these are my people and they're going to fall in love. And then you have to communicate that to the reader so that they buy into these emotions that they're feeling. And so like, I know why, but trying to articulate exactly what it is about people that makes them fall in love. It's like this sort yeah. of halfway mystical, halfway psychological, emotional thing that you have to put on the page. And, and that can be difficult. Mia, I, I read that you said the humor can sometimes be hard when you're writing romantic comedy because, you know, humor, it, it is subjective. No question. And so for me, it's always a challenge. I often uh, send texts uh, during the day, much to my family and friends' chagrin. They're sort of like, what? And I'm always like, is this funny? Uh, <laughs> I just need you to listen to this. <laughs> change and tell me have I gone too far it's it's one of those things where I just never know and if enough people are sort of like haha yes go with it um, then I go with it sometimes I just know um, and I don't question it but I think there is there is a challenge there's a challenge in uh, trying to be funny but not trying to be too funny um, but also always making sure that the two people on the page are being funny in a way that isn't mean, um, that doesn't cross a line, that always reminds the reader that at the core, these are good people. You know, it's kind of one of those things where I just want to make sure that at all times the reader is sort of rooting for these two people. Do you base characters um, on real people, friends, family, or do you ever have somebody say like, I know that's me. Does that happen? Or are they completely out of your imagination? I think my favorite thing to do is to take kind of elements of people who I know very well and then weave them together to create something new that's very grounded in something that's real to me. So like a lot of the families that I write, the family members are like reflections of my own family members. And I think, you know, I have this aunt who's really funny and my grandma is really nosy. And if I mix them into this <laughs> character, it's going to be hilarious. So <laughs> that's one thing I like to do, but never for main characters, because then it would get weird uh -huh. when you make them kiss. <laughs> right, right, right. But Talia, does your family ever realize that? Do they know that you're doing that? Ah, well, the thing is, my family members are not allowed to read my books, so I'm getting away with it. <laughs> okay. 
Mary, the lead on us, do tell. I think I'm just really self-conscious about everything. To my friends, I'm like, if you want to read the book, live your life, just don't tell me that you read it. But to my family members, it's a hard no. I'm sorry. Did all of you start out as romance readers? Is that how you came to the genre? Or was there something in particular about it that drew you to the genre? I didn't start out as a romance reader. I read a few romances when I was young, but really as an adult after college, I got into paranormal romance. I grew up reading classics and some science fiction and fantasy, just kind of everything. Um, but I was really drawn towards romance. And as an adult, I think uh, the happily ever afters that you know, are required of a romance were really comforting to me. And I still find those comforting, especially in today's times. Yeah, we could um, all use happily ever after right now. <laughs> For me, I was starting uh, to work on One to Watch in early 2017, and I my job before that was I was the lead digital writer for Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, and I was in, I would say, not a great place emotionally um, in early 2017. And I was, you know, working on a lot of different ideas, and some were rom-coms and some weren't, and when I landed on this idea, it just made me happy, and I just wanted you know, a story where I could sort of do writing that reflected my values, but that also, as Leslie was saying, you know, had that happily ever after and had that, that feeling of yeah. joy that I really needed then and that I think we all really need now. Because it is romance, do you feel compelled to have a happy ending? Or do you think it's possible to redefine maybe what the happy ending is? Is it always that the two people end up together? Yeah. <laughs> It is. Exactly. That's the promise. You can't break the promise. That's mean. Give the people what they want. <laughs> if, if it's a romance. I mean, if you're writing something else that's not a romance, yes, you can yeah. innovate and do all kinds of just different interesting things. I mean, or if you're doing like a serialized story and they're going to get there happily ever after in the next, oh, the third in the yeah. trilogy or something like that. But there is that promise. And it's, it's the only hard and fast rule about a romance is either a happy for now or happily ever after. So when you're trying to do things that are fancy, you're not really writing romance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will say, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm coming out on, on this TV show that I want to watch is structurally not a romance. Um, it's a single protagonist story um, and it's, it's, it's just not structured that way. So um, it, it has a total three act structure, but you, one of the, pleasures of the book for me is you don't know if she's going to end up with anyone or not and sort of you have to keep reading in order to find out so hopefully um so I say yes but as Leslie says what I what I have written generically is is not a romance right although it is ro it is romantic and it is about yeah oh absolutely super romantic yeah <laughs> it's not structurally a romance um, well, that leads me to another question that I have, this one for all of you. Since we are talking about romance, I would love to hear what your version of the perfect romantic night would be, if you would care to share it with me, or maybe something romantic that's ever happened to you. One of the most romantic things that has ever happened to me is I remember being on deadline a couple of years ago. My, uh, my family and I were planning to go to Brazil and we were going to be spending time with family there. And I was frazzled, like obviously trying to get a book in and at the same time trying to, to pack. And my husband comes in to the office and he's like, I've packed for the girls, I've packed my stuff. All you need to do is pack for yourself and check that I've done everything right for the girls' bags and that's it. And I like just sort of like went, okay, I really love you right now <laughs> because that was super romantic. It was just one of those things. Yeah. He didn't have to do it. We would have done it together, but he was like, I'm just not going to have her even worry about this. Anybody else want to just quickly tell us a romantic story or, or your vision of what a perfect romantic evening would be? I think I'm pretty low key in real life with romance. Anything very romantic makes me a bit cringy. But I was actually yesterday, I was very pleased because I was sat in the house, which is obviously all I do now, saying, Oh, I really miss the fries from Frankie and Benny's. And my boyfriend was like, Well, let's get some. We can like order some and we can go and get it. But we live in the middle of nowhere. So I was like, we'll have to drive really far. And he was like, so what else have I got to do? Like get in the car. <laughs> so we went to this restaurant and picked up fries and some pizza and ate it in the car. And I was so happy. The core of romance is, uh, you know, domestic tasks, cooking for us, cleaning, packing. Because yeah, I'm going to be the same thing. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> really predictable. Kate, what about you? 
Um, I find, so this is, this is platonic, but I often find that the great things that friends do are, are, if our romantic partners could take a hint from that, that would be great. (laughs) But so early in the, uh, you know, isolation period and I live alone. So it's been, it's been tough. My best friend made a care package for me where she got me, um, like, hand sanitizer and a whole bunch of weed gummies and velvet scrunchies that the cult there were like different ones that were like the colors of the different queer flags said queer and it was just like this really lovely like when I was feeling so sad because I couldn't see anyone or do anything that she just was able to drop off this package and make me know that she was thinking of me and make me feel really loved and I think you know that's all that's how all any of us wants to feel is loved yeah that's for sure that's for sure I'm with you on the quiet evening my dog, my husband, some wine, (laughs) all good. Well, I think we do have to wrap it up there, but I just want to say first that I so enjoyed this time with all of you. I really appreciate uh, your talking to me today and thank you again so much. Be well, guys. Thank you. Thank you. What a fun group. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. That wraps up another chapter of Book It with CA, but we will be back soon. In the meantime, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Suggestions are always welcome, and we'd love to know what you're reading. Also, you can find this episode and more details on our website. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Thanks so much for watching, and see you next time.